Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, in this class we are going to continue looking at hemodynamic disturbances. This group of disorders involves a number of different problems that can occur because of aberrations in our blood circulation either at the level of the heart, the blood vessels or the microcirculation. In this class we will focus on hyperemia and congestion. So by the end of this lesson, you should be able to define hyperemia and congestion. We should be able to understand the causes and the mechanisms for each of these. And briefly, we will look at the morphological changes in some of the organs that are affected by this condition. Both hyperemia and congestion are characterized by increased blood volume within a tissue. However, the basic underlying mechanisms are different. While hyperemia is an active process that causes increased blood within a tissue, congestion occurs by a passive process. However, in both there is a local increase in the blood volume within a given tissue or organ. So let us now look at the differences. Hyperemia is an active process that is brought about by arteriolar dilatation and that allows increased blood to come into the tissue. So where do we see this? You would have learnt about this in inflammation. It also occurs in exercise where more blood is required by the skeletal muscle throughout the body and therefore arteriolar dilatation permits more blood to flow into the tissue. A simple physiological mechanism of blushing is also by this same mechanism where increased blood flow occurs into the arterioles in the cheek tissue. The tissue becomes engorged with oxygenated blood brought in by the arteriolar dilatation. Therefore, the affected site will appear reddish in color. So in hyperemia, we are seeing increased blood coming into the microcirculation as a result of arteriolar dilatation and it is occurring by an active process. This is an example where you can see that there is hyperemia or increased blood in the conjunctival tissue in a patient with conjunctivitis and this is secondary to inflammation. Now in contrast to this, congestion is a passive process. It occurs because the blood flow out of a tissue is impaired, meaning there is impaired venous outflow from the tissue. Congestion can be systemic or localized to a given tissue. However, here because the blood is not flowing out from the tissue, the oxygen which is present in the blood is drawn away by the tissues and cells. So deoxygenated blood is remaining in the tissue and this gives the tissue a bluish red color. Clinically, we refer to that tissue as cyanotic or cyanosis. Here there is long standing hypoxia and this may result in cell death, cell injury and fibrosis. Further, the buildup of pressure within the blood, within the venous side of the circulation causes focal hemorrhage in the tissue and subsequent changes due to that. Congestion can be acute if there is sudden obstruction to the venous outflow 
or it can be chronic when say for example, the cardiovascular system is responsible for the congestion. We also use other synonyms for congestion in the tissues like chronic venous congestion. Sometimes congestion is also referred to as passive hyperemia. What happens because of this venous congestion? One, there will be increased venous pressure. This can cause the congestion within the tissue. There can be obstruction inside a vein. For example, if a thrombus was to develop in a vein, it would cause congestion. Thirdly, the vein may be compressed from the outside, for example, by a growing tumor. Reduced outflow of blood from the tissue results in accumulation of deoxygenated blood and therefore, cyanosis as we already said. So, in congestion there is stagnation in the venous side of the circulation causing cyanosis. So, looking at it together hyperemia an active process occurs because of arteriolar dilatation and this results in increased oxygenated blood within the tissue. This in turn will cause the area to appear reddish when examined clinically. Congestion is because of stagnation of blood in the venous side of the circulation, which means that there is going to be more deoxygenated blood and therefore, that part is going to look bluish on clinical examination. Congestion therefore, can be systemic if it is occurring say for example, secondary to cardiac failure. So, if there is left sided heart failure, we are going to see chronic venous congestion in the lungs. If there is right sided heart failure, we are going to see systemic venous congestion. Localized chronic venous congestion can occur if a particular vein is obstructed to a particular tissue or organ. For example, if there is a deep venous thrombosis in the leg, the leg tissue is going to show features of chronic venous congestion. The affected tissue is usually cool, edematous, dusky, blue gray in color. Now, what happens as a result of this chronic venous congestion in the tissue? One, because of the hypoxia, the parenchyma undergoes atrophy, degenerative changes and long standing hypoxia can even cause tissue necrosis. 2. Because of the venous stasis, there is increased hydrostatic pressure within the venous circulation and that results in the formation of edema, that is the movement of fluid out of the vein into the interstitium. Because of the buildup of pressure in the venous circulation, the microcirculation may develop small hemorrhages due to capillary rupture. The escaped blood is then broken down and that results in the formation of hemosiderin pigment and this is deposited in the tissues as well as taken up by the macrophages that are present in the tissue. Because of the hemorrhages and in a long standing process like this, the tissue repair is developed because of resulting in fibrosis of the tissue and long standing scars because of this fibrosis, we will further see dystrophic calcification. Chronic venous congestion is commonly seen in organs like lung, liver and spleen. Let us see some of the salient features of congestion in these organs. We said that if there is left sided heart failure, there will be congestion of the lungs. So, what do we see in the lungs? We said that there is venous stagnation. So, as a result of the increased hydrostatic pressure in the interalveolar septae, fluid will escape into the septa and the alveolar spaces. So, pulmonary edema will occur as well as hemorrhages because of rupture of some of these smaller vessels. So, the lung as a whole will increase in weight, it will become soggy it will have a sub crepitant texture and when we cut such lungs, 
we see that a lot of frothy hemorrhagic fluid will escape from the cut surface. Microscopically, we find that the alveolar septae in long standing chronic venous congestion of the lung becomes thickened, there is edema in the alveolar space, extravasation of RBCs from micro ruptures results in the breakdown of that blood and formation of heart failure cells. What are these? These are macrophages that are normally present in the alveoli. They take up the hemosiderin golden brown pigment and they are called heart failure cells. With time, fibrosis occurs in the septa and in the areas where hemorrhage has occurred and the lung becomes a firm brown heavy organ. This is referred to as brown induration of the lung let us see what we see at the microscopic level. So, the first step when there is chronic venous congestion in the lung, you will see that in the septa, the vessels become congested. Because of the buildup of pressure, you find that the hydrostatic pressure increases and fluid escapes into the septa and the alveolar spaces. So, the patient will have pulmonary edema. As the pressure remains high in the venous radicals, you find that micro ruptures occur and hemorrhage occurs and that is broken down and phagocytosed by the alveolar macrophages. So, you will see an accumulation of pigment laden macrophages within the alveolar spaces. These are called heart failure cells. When right sided heart failure occurs, there is a build up of pressure in the venous circulation in the systemic side and first organ that we have there is the liver, uh, liver. So, we get chronic venous congestion of the liver. The back pressure first affects the central venous radicals. So, centrilobular areas of the lung parenchyma will first show signs of the congestion. Here there is hypoxia and therefore, the hepatocytes in the immediate vicinity of the central veins will undergo hypoxic necrosis. However, near the portal areas, you find that there is a protective arterial supply and the dual arterial supply protects the hepatocytes in the vicinity of the portal area. So, the portal hepatic hepatocytes are at first normal but with prolonged hypoxia, fatty change occurs in these areas. Here again, rupture of the sinusoids can cause hemorrhage in the parenchyma and this in turn will undergo fibrosis. So, in long standing chronic venous congestion, the hemorrhagic infarction in the area of the central vein will result in the formation of fibrosis and subsequently results in the formation of cirrhosis. This is also known as cardiac cirrhosis as it is occurring due to heart failure. So, what do we see in chronic venous congestion of the liver? In this picture, you can see the distended central veins filled with blood and the hepatocytes around the central veins have undergone necrosis. Whereas, further away in the hepatic parenchyma towards the portal areas, you find that the hepatocytes are still preserved and this is because of the dual blood supply occurring in the portal triad. With further hypoxia, we find that hepatocytes in the vicinity of the portal areas undergo fatty change. So, now we have two types of areas. Around the central vein, there is hemorrhagic infarction of the hepatocytes. Around the portal areas, there is fatty change. So, those tissues that are around the central vein will occur, appear dark and congested or dusky brown, whereas those hepatocytes near the portal area would impact, impart a yellowish color. So, if we look at a gross specimen, we will see alternated dark congested areas and yellow areas. This appearance that is seen of the liver in CVC is called nutmeg liver because it is similar to the appearance of a nutmeg. The liver in CVC will be enlarged, 
the margins or borders will become rounded, the capsule becomes stretched out and on cut surface we will see alternating light and dark areas. This is also called nutmeg liver. The dark areas that are seen on the cut surface corresponds to the congested area around the central vein. The pale areas which you see on the gross correspond to the fatty change that is seen in the periportal area. You can also see a picture of a nutmeg and how similar it is to the change you are seeing in the liver in CVC, the nutmeg liver. With time I told you there is fibrosis occurring in the central areas and wherever there has been hemorrhage. So, the liver then shrinks in size and becomes nodular. This is referred to as cardiac cirrhosis. In CVC spleen, we find that it occurs when there is CVC or cirrhosis of the liver with portal hypertension. Therefore, there will be a back pressure on the splenic vein causing CVC of the spleen. CVC spleen can occur not only in cirrhosis but also in right heart failure and after there is cardiac liver cirrhosis. Portal venous thrombosis or splenic venous thrombosis also can cause CVC of the spleen. Basically all these diseases cause elevated splenic venous pressure which causes an enlarged reddish purple spleen. The longer the congestion, the more firm the spleen becomes in consistency. On microscopy, we find that the red pulp is affected and not the white pulp. So, the sinusoids in the red pulp become distended with blood. Fibrosis occurs off the sinusoidal walls and with time, we find that the capsule and the trabeculae are also thickened by fibrosis. Sinusoidal rupture can occur resulting in hemorrhage in the splenic parenchyma. Breakdown of this blood results in the formation of hemosiderin pigment granules which are deposited in the hemorrhagic areas. In the hemorrhagic areas again fibrosis develops, hemosiderin pigment is deposited, hemosiderin pigment is taken up by macrophages. With time, the fibrous areas develop calcium deposits. This structure together is referred to as the Gandhi gamma bodies or the Gandhi gamma nodules, that is, nodules of fibrosis which have hemosiderin pigment deposits and calcification are the Gandhi gamma bodies. These bodies are also referred to as siderotic nodules or fibrosiderotic nodules. They will stain positively with pearl stain. Pearl stain, you know, detects the hemosiderin pigment in the tissue. It will also stain with the von Cosa stain. Von Cosa stain is used to demonstrate calcium in the tissue. These fibrotic scars disrupt the local architecture of the spleen. Besides CVC spleen, Gandhi-Gamma bodies can also be seen in the spleen in patients having sickle cell anemia or hemochromatosis. In CVC, the enlarged spleen can be moderate to markedly enlarged and is very, very friable. Therefore, it is prone to rupture when there is minor trauma as well. Persistent enlargement of the spleen like this with stagnation of blood as it passes through that enlarged congested spleen results in destruction of the blood cells and, a, and cytopenias in the peripheral circulation. This hyperfunctioning of the spleen is referred to as hypersplenism. We therefore have now gone through hyperemia and congestion. We have seen that hyperemia is an active process caused by arteriolar dilatation and congestion is a passive process caused by venous stagnation. We have seen the mechanism. We have seen that there are some changes occurring in organs like the lung, 
liver and spleen. The lung we see brown in duration, in the liver we see nutmeg appearance and the spleen becomes markedly enlarged resulting in hypersplenism.